are tuned into our special Like a Boss Girl series called Mind of a Mentor. I want to welcome everyone who's joining the call and just a favor would ask if you could just mute your mic because otherwise I will be hearing lots of chatter. Um, anyway, my name is Marla Isaacson and I am the founder of Like a Boss Girls. We here at Like a Boss Girls are a badass community of women who are defining a new normal and bringing you along with us. We want to empower you to live life on your own terms while giving you the support, encouragement, and information you need to make a living, make a difference, and make it big. The purpose of our Mind of a Mentor series is to showcase women who have experienced significant roadblocks and difficulties in their life and how they overcame these struggles to achieve great success. We believe that these stories will help you gain valuable insights and inspiration to help you on your life's journey. Today we have Michelle Erland, welcome Michelle, General Manager at Giovanni Rana Restaurant in New York. And Michelle's also a certified sommelier. Michelle went from being a bartender at a local NYU bar to managing the New York home of Italy's most loved fresh pasta in just under two years. And this wasn't without strife. Michelle lost both of her parents within a few years of one another, just as she was entering childhood. Through her struggles, she was able to achieve meaningful success. We're sure you can find strength in her story today. First of all, welcome, Michelle, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Hello to everybody who is here today. Um, I look forward to sharing my story with all of you. Oh, that's great. Um, and congrats on uh, your promotion to general manager at Giovanni Rana. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm very, very happy and honored for the position and the opportunity to grow. That's great. Um, so I know our listeners are really interested to hear more about your story and your achievements and your career progression, which is super interesting. So. What I like to do is always start at the beginning. I understand that you grew up in Long Island, and by the way, so did I. I grew up in Oceanside. Amazing, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So please tell us about Michelle as a child. Tell us about your younger self. So I did grow up in Long Island in a small town called Port Jefferson, which I'm sure you know. Um, and for those who don't know, it's a beautiful town right on the water. Um, when I was a kid, I was heavily involved in ballet and dancing. It was my passion. Um, like many kids, you know, I wanted to be a ballerina when I grew up and I would spend every opportunity that I had outside of school going to ballet class. Oh, um, yes, yes. Uh, both my parents were actually very supportive of my passion and so much so that they got involved in the ballet school that I went to. And my father even went so far as to perform in the Nutcracker with me. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. I don't think my dad would have done that for me. So <laughs> more power to you. To your dad well, I signed him up without his knowledge first, but <laughs> then he loved it so much that he did it for 10 years with the, the ballet company it was called Harbor Ballet Theater. So he, he did it after I graduated and I moved on, he stayed with them dancing. Oh, that's great. Oh my gosh. Yes. So tell us a little bit about the community um, that you, that tell us about, you know, the, the community, was it tight knit, that kind of, of thing. Yeah, so um, the community I grew up in is a very small town and everybody knows everybody, um, which is a beautiful thing and sometimes not such a beautiful thing, <laughs> but um, my parents were uh, very well respected in my town. My father actually was in politics and he was um, a trustee of our local village. So um, they, were, they were considered everybody's parents in the town. Um, when people were over, you know, they all considered my parents part of their upbringing as well. So, so how did, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Michelle. No, it's okay. You can go ahead. 
So how did this relationship with your parents in terms of them being so involved with the town, how did that impact your childhood? If you could just talk a little bit more about that. Of course. Um, you know, it's surprising that you, you mention it because I honestly didn't realize how much they were involved in the community and how well respected they were until after my father passed away. And I was blown away hearing people's stories. And, um, but as a kid, you just, I mean, they're just your parents. So, you know, you don't really, they don't, they were very humble people. So they didn't ever share the little things that they did. Or um, I remember someone came up to me and said, your father would go over to my mother's house who's 80 years old every year and install her air conditioning since he was a kid. So just like the little things that my parents did, I only found out about after they passed away. So how did this situation um, inspire you as you were um, going into adulthood, just in terms of learning about your parents and, and how admired they were in, the, in, the, in your community? Um, I think there's a couple ways that it, it inspired and affected me. Um, first and foremost, just the compassion that they had for other people um, definitely has brought with me and always trying to do better, be better, um, teach others, give to others. And in the end, it actually does make you a stronger worker, a stronger person, able to accomplish your goals as well. And I saw that very much so in my father, um, who held multiple you know, jobs in his career and um, was involved in everything from local sports to the fire department and excelled very well in everything that he did. Um, and also on the other side, just you know, realizing the support that I had. Sometimes I think when you're a kid, you don't necessarily understand the support you have in a community or a family. Um, and I think now when I look back at it, understanding it, I'm so grateful for it that it inspired me to push harder and succeed so I can help others as well. So did your parents have any specific words of wisdom that they kept on saying to you over and over again? I know my dad would always say to me, now just do the right thing. Any words of wisdom? Um, share with you? Yes, actually. So my mother, I'll never forget when I was probably like nine years old. Um, she, like I said, I was heavily involved in ballet and she mentioned, you know, parts came out and all my friends got wonderful parts in the show and I was left behind and I got a part, but it wasn't, you know, at the same level as everyone else. And I remember my mother saying to me at nine or 10, um, you have the option to quit. You have the option to quit if you want, but you cannot go back. Because she was very much saying, if this is what you want to do and you don't like the outcome of a certain situation, you have to keep pushing to do better. Right. So if I wanted to give up, she said, you're, then you're giving up on dance and you do something else. But you can't just give up because you get something that you don't want or something that you don't like. And that st stuck with me for my entire life so far. And I continue to live that. I think those are amazing words of wisdom. Seriously, I, I actually got chills when you were saying them. So um, so let's talk about you, your schooling. I know you attended SUNY Old Westbury and you got a degree in American Studies. So how did you pivot from American Studies to your interest in um, wine and restaurant management. What was that trajectory like? So I have always been in some form in hospitality because um, it started as a part-time job. It was always a way to make a good income and continue doing everything else that I wanted to do. And I really did like history and the American Studies degree that I got from SUNY Old Westbury was very, it was a mix between learning about American history, but also 
people, like different personalities, understanding, you know, photographs, how they change um, the situation, how they change what a story is, um, which I feel set me up for my sommelier training and my love for wine because wine goes so far past just the drink in front of you. It goes down to history of the land it came from, the geography, it goes to the people and what they believe and their culture. So those two, history and American studies, those two things go together hand in hand. Um, so I actually went to culinary school when I decided I wanted to really take wine, my wine studies to the next level. And I attended the International Culinary Center in Soho. And I graduated from there and then went on to take my level one and level two, which is my certified exam through the Court of Master Sommeliers. Okay, this is amazing. So I'm just curious, what do you actually study um, when you're um, getting a degree uh, to be a sommelier? What kinds of things do you have to learn so that you actually really understand wines and and of course. the history and all that? Of course. Um, so you start learning the basic of winemaking, how wine is formed, um, how alcohol is for, uh, formed, the fermentation process. So you start learning the science of a fermented beverage. Um, and then when you go heavily into your sommelier studies, you start to study each wine region in the world in depth. Um, so you learn the rules of France, you learn what grapes grow there, you learn the soil, you learn the typical climate, you learn how the culture is affects the winemaking. Um, I happen to absolutely love Italian wine. Um, that's my specialty. So every single day I'm, I'm consistently studying something about wine uh, in Italy. Um, so pretty much that. And then when you, when you go to take your exam, it's important also you understand service because being in hospitality, it's nice that you know where a Burgundy wine comes from in France, but you have to be able to communicate with people everyday people in a restaurant, get them to understand what they're drinking and why they should drink it and get them excited about it. That is really the end goal of our position. So when I'm in a restaurant and we're choosing a wine, um, we hear terms like, oh, it's spicy or it's full bodied um, okay. or it's a little young. What, what, if, what does that mean? <laughs> so, we, I call them, those are like the glamorous terms. So, oh. I mean, they might say something like creamy to you or spicy, and it could indicate numerous things in a wine. So my, my lovely aunt actually loves California Chardonnay. Um, and I know from her telling me this, that she likes a fuller body Chardonnay ripe fruit because the climate in California is ripe. She likes oak. Oak sometimes comes off in wine through um, baking spices like vanilla or comes off um, even like coconut. American oak usually comes off like dill or coconut. So they're glamorous words or descriptors to understand what you're tasting because you're not actually tasting like coconut, the fruit. Right. So what is the secret in selecting a great bottle of wine? I, <clears throat> I was in a, a wine store yesterday where I was having friends over last night for a book group and we like to drink wine when we're talking mm -hmm. about books. Um, but I have to admit, I was really overwhelmed. There were so many choices and I wasn't really sure how to approach my wine selection. I mean, I looked at the wine spectator ratings, but you know, do you have any other, do you have any guidance in terms of how to make a smart decision when selecting yeah. I mean, always, even so, I have training, but when I'm at a restaurant or a wine store, I always speak to 
the sommelier or the person who's buying the wine because they're going to know the product that was bought for the restaurant. Mm -hmm. I would say my advice in wine uh, shopping is to be, be open-minded because you'd be surprised. A lot of people will hear a name of something and they won't try it because they don't know or don't recognize the name. And unfortunately it happens a lot, but there's some wonderful wines out there. Just people are afraid of the name. And right. um, also I would say, I usually pick somewhere that I want to visit. <laughs> so it gets me excited. Okay. So that's how I go into a store. Cause if I want to go to South Africa, I'm going to go and look for Stellenbosch and get excited about the region and the wine. So um, question, at your restaurant at Giovanni Rana, how do patrons interact with the sommelier? What's the best way of, of you know, sort of making sure that it's a good interaction? Um, again, so I actually have a great team uh, that works with me. So I have numerous people that can help guide our guests. We are a very large restaurant and we do see many, many people in a day. Um, sometimes you'll have people that ask for us right away. Sometimes you'll have people that are having a little bit of trouble picking out with the server, so the server will request to send a sommelier over. Um, but usually I just try to get to know the, the customer. That's my way. Um, you listen to them, find out what they've tasted before. You kind of can assess if they're willing to try something new. You can see if they're very much like, this is the only thing that I like. And you help guide them into a place where they're going to be comfortable and happy. Right. Thank so, you. So you're let, let's transition into the journey of your process of building your career um, and overcoming a great deal of hardship um, and the grief that you had to um, experience uh, okay. when you lost your parents. Of course. So um, my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer when I was in high school. I was 15. So a large portion of my life, I, I do remember my mom being sick, but my mom was um, very determined. Uh, she was a fighter. So she lived for eight years um, with colon cancer, numerous surgeries, and she never let it stop her from living life. So it always very much inspired me to push harder. Um, so my mother passed away uh, in 2008. And I would say the last year before she passed away, she was very much sick or she just could not have a, a good way of life. So I could actually see in my mom's eyes that she was, she was done. She was ready to, she felt that her children had the tools that were needed to have the best life that they could. Um, she wanted to see all three of us graduate high school. I have a brother and a sister and my sister had just graduated high school. So uh, she felt very much that, you know, she fought to make sure that we were going to be okay. So after my mom passed away, I actually moved into the city. So I, uh, into Brooklyn. And that's when I got the job um, bartending at a bar in the NYU area. And it was great. It was great because um, I met new people, of course. It was great. I was just excited to have a job. And also the money was great because it was constantly full with college kids. Um, and I was able to support myself for the first time. And that was what was so important to me is like figuring out how to stand on my own. And um, then figure out the next step. What was I going to do? What did I want to do for my career? But that was why I ended up at that NYU bar. So how did you balance, and balance is not the best word, but how did you deal with these very significant issues in your family, these tragedies, 
while you were trying to build your career. I mean, uh, it's a very difficult situation. Yes, and I know, of course. Uh, many of our listeners have also experienced a, a lot of grief. But how? What was your coping mechanism? How did you integrate both uh, aspects of your life so actually you could move forward? Um, I did, after my mom passed away, about a year later, I did begin, um, I went to therapy uh, once a week and it, and it helped me um, just talk out things that maybe I was not understanding. Um, also, I was very lucky where it helps me realize that the emotions that you're having are okay to have. Um, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be confused. It's okay to be upset. And it very much helped me not hold it all in where it consumed my everyday life. I mean, there's times that you, you get upset, you know, if someone next to you gets a phone call and it says, mom, you're, it, it does hit you in a place that you don't understand. So you're in that position, but, um, I just kept pushing because I knew, you know, this is why my mom pushed through eight years of an illness and why my dad worked so hard to give us this life. And it kind of just kept me motivated to do whatever I could to move up and be the best or I could be. So what advice based on this experience that you have, what advice would you give to our members to help them cope with very tragic situations, difficult, difficult family issues? I think not keeping it all inside is so important. Finding, you know, anybody like just to get it out because if you keep it inside, it really can consume your day-to-day -day life. Um, and sometimes talking, like if you find things that even made you happy, you know, like I, I laugh at some things that my parents did and it's a way for me to talk about it. It doesn't always have to be in a sad way. Um, but I would say in terms of balancing your life, some advice that I would give is it's okay to create your own timeline and your own journey. And I think that's, for me, my mo I stopped school. My mother passed away. I went back to school. And I went back to college when other people my age or in my class had graduated and now they're getting the big jobs and I'm bartending. And for me, accepting that your journey is the only journey that really needs to matter for you was very important. So this is very inspiring. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit um, about your, your dad. I know that your, your father also passed away um, and that was a very tragic situation. How did you cope with yet a second tragedy? So my father, four years after my mother, um, he began acting very weird. And, you know, I'm very lucky that I have two siblings who are very strong and we have a great relationship and we, we stick together and um, I'm lucky for that. But my father started acting weird and multiple times we sent him to the hospital because, you know, he seemed as though he was having a stroke or a heart attack or couldn't remember where he lived and he lived in the same town for his entire life. Um, and when we brought him to the hospital, that hospital actually kept admitting him into the psychiatric unit. So my brother, my sister and I and my family dealt with uh, this misdiagnosis of my father for about a month and trying to get him out of the psych ward and then he would come home and 
we'd bring him back to the hospital because he was, you know, breathing weird and they would put him back in the psych unit. So it was a very rough month. And going back to my work life, um, at this point, I was bartending at this bar for three years and I was also the general manager of this bar. And um, I was able to have a flexible schedule, but I still continued to show up every day for my shifts, but I was able to move things around to be there for my dad and my family. Uh, one month after my father acting weird, we brought him to New York City and they diagnosed him immediately with a very rare disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, um, which is the human form of mad cow. It's a prion disease. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very um, rough thing to watch and it's very rough way to see your family member um, and very hard to take care of. And uh, so basically we brought my father in because we took him out of one hospital that had him in a psych unit and we brought him into another hospital that told us immediately that he was, they were releasing him on hospice. And from diagnosis to death was um, one month. So it happened very fast, almost so fast where you could not register what was going on while it was going on. I'm so, and, I'm so sorry to hear about this. This is just so, it's just incredibly awful. Yeah, and, it, and you know, my mother was ill for a long time, but when you live it for eight years, you know it's coming and you're able to prepare yourself a little, but this was so fast that it left my entire family completely just shocked and confused because there's no answers. There's no answers to why this happened, how it happened. There's absolutely nothing. So it definitely left um, all of us, you know, in a, in a down position. So how did Michelle take care of Michelle during this time period? I mean, I have always dug myself into work. Always. When I was a kid, I would dig myself into dance. So I, I like working. It was my way to positively uh, cope in a way. You know, like I, I didn't want to be going out. I didn't want to be putting myself in situations where, you know, I, I could be negatively affected. So I always kept working and studying because it was my way of coping. So one question that I know our listeners will have, which is during this very difficult time, you, you mentioned that you had a more flexible schedule at work. How were you able to have that conversation with your bosses? Was that a challenging conversation? Do you have any insights or advice that we can give our listeners? I mean, I, if I was a person that never missed work, so from day one, no matter what job I had, I always showed up to work. I always showed up on time. I always pushed myself to do 100% every day. So when I got into a situation that I could not control, I was able to go to my boss and be completely honest. And he looked at me and said, do whatever you need to do. Okay. So I think that's why it's so important. And I tell, right now I have a very large team at the restaurant. And I tell them every day to being on time, being at work is important because one day something's going to happen and you call out and someone's going to say, oh, this is typical, you know? Right, right. I think we have a little feedback, Michelle. Yes. So, so, what would be your net up takeaway in terms of your your advice to our listeners? In terms of how to um, take 
such tragedies and turn it in and overcome? How do you overcome? I mean, I mean, I think for everyone, the way they cope is different. But at the end of the day, everyone deserves the best life that you can have. And I think that everyone is capable of that. And that is what always stayed in my head. So if you want to get a degree, go get it. If it's going to take you longer, do it. If it's if you can only afford one class at a time, do it. But I think always setting your goals and pushing and knowing that if you hit a bump and you need to stop, take a step back and continue pushing, it's, it's so worth it. It's worth everything, you know. Okay. So I'm not sure if someone else has their mic on, but um, if you could just turn it off because we're hearing a little bit of feedback. That'd be great. That'd be great. Okay. So, um, so um, here at Like a Boss School, like a boss school we work to inspire our readers and members to live their lives with purpose and passion. What inspires you? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last sentence. Yeah, I'm going to try to see if you can see that. Paige, I think you're on. If you could just mute your mic, maybe that would help. Better, yes. Thank you. Okay. So, as I was saying, here at Like a Boss Girls, we work to inspire our readers and members to live their lives with purpose and passion. What inspires you? Um, so, I think what inspires me in my career is I, I truly like to make people happy. And I think that's why I ended up in the hospitality industry. So if I can make someone else feel better in something so simple as the perfect event or the perfect dinner, then I'm in a way inspired to do more, create more. Um, I also believe in mentors and you know, we're here on this mind of a mentor right now, but I do very much um, try to take as much as I can from people that inspire me. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be people that are in your career, but it's people that have found a way to, you know, live a full life. Um, it inspires me every day. So it sounds like your parents were your mentors. Um, any other thoughts on finding um, how to find a mentor or how you found a mentor beyond your family? Of course. Um, I would say, you know, mentors, you can have many mentors over a lifetime because I think in each stage of your life you are, you know, you need someone to help you learn or do something else. Um, definitely when I was a kid, I had my dance teacher. Um, her name is Amy Tyler. She was a big mentor for me. Um, I think she taught me how to take, you know, when you are feeling bad or, you know, when you're going through what I was going through when I was dancing, that finding a positive outlet like dance or doing something uh, physical helps you, you know, get out the emotions in a positive way. Um, uh, currently, right now, I would say my boss at work, Antonella Rana, is a big mentor for me now because she pushes me and challenges me to um, be better every single day in my position, in my career. And she's taught me something very important, which is that mistakes can happen, um, but it's always you know, you have to learn from it, but in every situation, even if there's 20 people involved, you always have to remember what did you do and how did you do um, to, for this outcome to occur, both negative and positive. And she is definitely a big inspiration in my career right now. So um, what we'd like to do now is open up the floor for questions. So um, if people have a question, let us know. Um, 
You can unmute your mic to ask the question, but we would ask if you would just uh, mute it when you hear the response. So does anyone have a question? Yes, I do. This is Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for joining. Yeah, so Michelle, thank you so much for being so open and um, yeah, it just, I mean, I know you've had some time to to process your life experiences, but I just, A, wanted to say thank you, number one. And number two is where do you see yourself, like what are your career goals right now? Um, as general manager, is that kind of where you want to stay? Do you want to branch off in your own like have your own business like what are your career goals because you've had a interesting road so far and I want to know what you're setting for yourself of course of course um, so right now as GM it is a recent position for me so I definitely want to spend more time growing in this position um, and I do think Growing, when I say it's not just me, but growing your team and getting your team to be stronger is what shows the success of me as a GM. Um, I do see myself wanting to stay with Giovanni Rana for a very long time. I think there's a lot of room to grow in the future into a director position. There's so many possibilities, but I would say down the line, I've always wanted my own little wine bar somewhere in a quiet town. So we'll see. I think there's there's so much time and there's so many possibilities. And I mean, one short little goal is I want to be fluent in Italian. So that's something just I want to learn personally. Um, so yeah. That's awesome. I have, I want to follow it up with one more question. Sorry to like hog the floor. No, but okay. um, <laughs> what do you, I ask this of all the women I meet who I think are pretty darn badass. Um, what do you read? Are, are you on like, do you do a low information diet because you just want to focus on work? Are you constantly reading? Do you only read nonfiction? Like what do you consume? Of course. So um, right now, because I am still studying um, for two separate wine exams um, every hour that I have outside of work I am studying wine reading wine um, I'm actually leaving for Italy tomorrow because I have an exam a week from today in Verona it's an Italian wine exam so every for the past six months I've been studying Italian wine reading Italian wine thinking Italian wine drinking everything Italian wine um, so yeah, pretty much it's all wine books at the moment. <laughs> okay. All wine books. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait to start. I uh, have some Italian language books, so those are on the back burner when this is done, then I'm going to move on to those. Got it. Well, thank you. So I have a question if that's okay. It's on. Hi. So Michelle. Hi, um, I have a question. So you were extremely lucky to find a company like Giovanni Rana. Can you tell us a little bit about like, number one, when you like applied for that job, what you were attracted to? And like, how did you know that that was the right company for you? And then, well, this is kind of three questions in one. And then while you're in that job, how did you know that it was going to be the career path that you wanted, like the company that you would pursue your career with? Of course. Um, so actually when I applied to Giovanni Rana company, I came to an open call because I knew I was ready. You know, my father had passed away and I outgrew the, the bar that I was running and I knew I was ready to take the next step and I wasn't really sure what that was. Um, but I said, let me start going on interviews so I can practice because I think it's so important. Um, even if you're not looking for a job to be able to practice 
talking and interviewing. So I went in for an open call and I did really well. And then I came back for a couple, two more interviews. And what drew me into this company was how much they consider their employees family. Um, the message of the company, which is, you know, the hospitality experience, the freshness of the pasta, enjoying company, making people happy. It made me happy to be sharing their vision with people in the United States. So that's what drew me to this company. Um, I would say the third question you said, what inspired Did you? Did you continue to know that it was the right company for you? Yeah. And actually, and I, as well, I have another one is, you know, somebody who is ambitious, how did you communicate it to your boss that you want to grow within that company too? Of course. So um, I would say I knew it was a company I wanted to stay with for a while because I saw opportunities ahead of me and I saw places that I could grow to and it inspired me to climb up the ladder. I saw that, you know, if you work hard and, and every day you continue to do better at just one thing and you keep pushing, you have the ability to work up the ladder of a hospitality company, a restaurant company. And this company gives every single one of its employees the opportunity to learn and grow. And I was very, um, like, I, it just inspired me and I wanted to learn more and do more and understand more. So. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Do we have any other questions? Anyone else? Okay, cool. So, Michelle, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and this was a really inspiring conversation. Thank you, you so any, much. Do you have any parting words that you want to share before we sign off? I mean, I would just, I think in terms of my situation and anybody who is in the same situation, I think it's just important to, to realize while there's things that are outside of your control, like, you know, death or illness, there's so much that is in your control to live your life to the fullest potential and even more so if you do have someone who has an illness, there's always time left to, you know, be with them and spend the time. And I think that's such an important thing to remember. I mean, we all, we're all going to eventually one day be ill, but we have time to do as much as we can and live an amazing life while we're here. So that's my words. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your insights and your honesty. And I know I learned a lot today, so we are very, very grateful. And for any New York peeps, make sure that you visit Giovanni Rana. Yes. Uh, they are, it's a wonderful Italian restaurant. So uh, anyways, thank you so much. And until next time, Thank you for joining us for Mind of a Mentor brought to you by likeabossgirls.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michelle.